the positive side to this is I'll probably eat 10% fewer french fries. Tested. Have you ever had gotten a, a packet of french fries and only eaten 90% of it? Uh, that's, that seems impossible. No, but I have gotten them not salted. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean you're seeing companies do this where I mean McDonald's does a pretty brisk breakfast business right but instead of staying open till midnight if they close at 10 we're we're gonna we're gonna survive right i just we're looking at a broader issue now where if it's at a point where it's affecting mcdonald's you wonder what it's like for that 10 million dollar manufacturing company down the street that you know isn't a big brand name like that how much is the staffing shortage hurting them? Mm-hmm. It's, true. it's true. And I, when I think about McDonald's too, I, I think it's, it's not just the hours, right? But at least around here, the in-store, I think, is has been closed forever. Like a, a lot of them are drive-through only. So there, there, there are a lot of impacts to, to this labor shortage on, on companies like this. I, I think what fast food found out in general was they didn't need the lobby. And you and I did a came did an episode mm-hmm. before I think about how revenue increased with the dining rooms closed. Now, with that being said, it is pure hell going anywhere near McDonald's after 11 a.m. The lines around the building and out to the street. So, you know, customer experience is terrible, but they kept the revenue up. Um, you know, drive throughs are gonna drive throughs are king is what it comes down to. In the winter, if you got kids during a pandemic, drive throughs win. But it's like, yeah. it's definitely, this has been going on since summer of 2021. It's really just starting, you didn't hear this getting talked about a lot on earnings calls. No one wanted to come out and say, hey, we're we're pretty much crippled down here right now. Okay, there was a, I stopped at a McDonald's at like 8.15 one night lines around the building there was one person you know how they got two windows yeah there's one person running back and forth between the two windows (laughs) and taking orders taking orders going on and getting you know getting paid taking orders getting paid running down putting like this person just looked exhausted and you didn't see anyone else in the back there's probably two people running that whole store and one day I was at a Panera Bread and I ordered my stuff two hours early and I get there at four o'clock and it's still not ready. And I I thought I'd seen my order up by the counter because their lobby's closed too. This lady comes out, she's probably about 60, 55, 60. She looks exhausted, apologizing, saying, we're running a drive through and this store, it's me and two other people. And this is a high volume store. Can I couldn't imagine doing lattes, baked goods, sandwiches, soups, a drive-through window, online orders with three people. Yeah. Um, but you know, if McDonald's and Panera Bread's experience, and I gotta start to think, we're seeing this in logistics and supply chain and manufacturing. There's problems coming that none of us want, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't often put a lot of um, uh, thought or whatever behind headlines and things, but you do. You are seeing a lot of headlines around burnout and things. And, and I mean, I'm lucky I work in a comfortable environment all day. But I, I, I guess when you put it like that, James, where you, where you talk about people who are working probably two, three people's jobs in a in a fast food restaurant, like I, I can see how, how you would get burned out for sure. Dennis, how many? clients on the manufacturing side right now do you think could afford to cut their hours by 10 percent? zero i mean every everyone right now is <clears throat> look, looking to maximize their capacity but they're, they're just there's a constraint on on, on the labor and they can only do so much i mean today you know for, <laughs> it's just funny i dropped off my vehicle at the dealership for to get serviced and it just looking in the showroom with zero cars in there is just it's just a crazy sight. 
you can't how do you how do you even get the impulse buyers right you got no cars right but the last time you were in there you said they weren't even expecting to see on lot inventory until the end of this year and with the way things are looking i don't know if that's going to come true either i don't believe so either i there's a part of me that a lot of these businesses have as you mentioned figured out a way to continue selling their product and you know figuring out saving costs in certain areas i think as a consumer we've been so accustomed to have everything to our disposal and now it's like we're struggling or some of us are struggling to realize that we have to kind of make some life changes as to when our expect you know life changes on expectations of when we can receive the things that we want. And I think in this case, like McDonald's, you know, they've worked on being so efficient for so many years between the lobby and the drive-through and timing the drive-through and how many seconds, you know, somebody sits at that spot at the window and, now it's like that's gone out the window like I, I can't even imagine that they're even uh looking at like the timing from point of order to point of receiving your product anymore because of this labor shortage so like they've had to make changes and i think it's you know slowly trickling down to our expectations of like how and the the, the quality of the product but also the timing of the product there's also opportunity here that if you can figure out a way to win right now <clears throat> where you can keep the customer service experience up and you can keep the wait times down and the product's still good, people are going to flock to you. I don't even think about going anywhere near. A lot of times I'm out and I'll stop. My dad loves fast food. He's 80 years old, grew up eating Whoppers. If I'm out, I'll say if you want something and, you know, 11 a.m. noon, he wants fast food. I won't even go anywhere near because there's nowhere I know that I could pull into other than Arby's, right? That doesn't have a half an hour wait to get around the line. And it's like, well, so now where do you go? It's just one of those things like you, you see how fast Portillo's moves people through the system or Chick-fil-A. Whoever can maintain that level of quality and service and customer experience right now is going to crush it. I just, how do you maintain that level at McDonald's when you got one person working two windows um, and, you know, maybe two people in the back doing the food? It's nearly impossible. I saw something cool on YouTube. It was, uh, you know, a robot that literally was making, you know, coffee drinks and uh, mixed cocktails. The cocktail even had the frosted glass, right? You weren't missing out on nothing, right? I, that's, hurry up hurry up and get this done as a business owner what else can you do if you don't have the the staff i mean you're you're seeing this very similar stress in the in this restaurant business as you see in the healthcare industry uh you know just people getting overwhelmed because of the demand uh it's it's really not as different in terms of like the the level of stress that a lot of these employees that are doing their best to accommodate, you know, customers and showing up to work every single day, but you're going to see that burnout. And, I, and I'm worried that over time in the, these next few months, that what's going to happen when people are like, forget this, um, you know, how much more of an issue the quick service uh, restaurant industry is going to have. I mean, imagine dealing with, I, I was at a fast food joint one time and they had a sign outside that said, please be nice to the people that actually showed up to work today. I, remember I sent you guys a text of the screenshot and it's like, could you imagine waiting in line at, for like 30 minutes and then, you know, God forbid something's wrong with the order because there's two people running up a $4 million fast food I mean, store. It's, that's what I mean by expectations. Like we have an expectation to get our food in, within seconds and you know, and also have a taste good. And it's like, I feel so sorry for these employees. And the fact that we have to like remind ourselves as customers to like, hey, there, there's only two or three people working in these restaurants. 
in, in servicing hundreds of people per hour, you know, it's, it's crazy. And you don't want to sit there and listen to these customers yell at you, right? Like it's, I, I also think the fast food industry, and if you ever watched the dirty job stuff with Mike Rowe, he talks a lot about how hard it is to find people to do these jobs anymore. But even with our, some of the manufacturing clients you deal with, Dennis, they're even realizing that it's not a wage issue. You can pay people 30 bucks an hour and they still don't want to go do that job. And I'm afraid that's where the entire hospitality industry is going, where it doesn't matter if McDonald's pays 25 bucks an hour. People just don't want to do that job. I'm sure if you paid some crazy amount of money, I mean, Kane, would you run a cash register for a hundred bucks an hour? Uh, it's tempting. Very compelling. <laughs> <laughs> bucks an hour? I am, what are you talking about? Two hundred grand a year? Uh, you know. <laughs> Come on. Visa, Mastercard, or cash? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you man. have you, you, the manufacturing sector has always, you know, not always, but in, I would say in the last like ten years, always had that make manufacturing sexy and that push to get people. Uh, interested from a very younger age. And I think all these industries that are struggling with attracting talent, I mean, they got to really start thinking about how can we sell uh, this job or our brand a little bit differently that's more geared towards just hiring. And I think people are, or a lot of businesses are just behind the ball game here uh, on doing um, you know certain marketing tactics to, to get their talent pool a little bit more filled. I just, I think when you spend 12 or whatever, 13 years, how many years you go through school and then you got teachers telling you for over a decade that you're too good for this. We have a workforce that just doesn't want to do this work. So I think it's just, I don't know what you could do to really make that job look good other than say, hey, get in here, work hard, become the shift supervisor, work your way up to manager that type of thing you know the people that gets into a manufacturing facility driving a high low 15 18 bucks an hour you know they work themselves up to supervisor they learn some more stuff maybe they take a class or two they become a warehouse supervisor warehouse manager and then they start climbing the ladder it's we don't want to spend a decade getting experience and actually building a career we expect to be that director of supply chain at 24 years old. And it's just, you can build a career. There's opportunities at Panera Bread and McDonald's and Chipotle Grill, even at the bottom. But we don't really paint that picture anymore. It's, you're too good for that. And I think manufacturing is suffering from that same thing right now. Um, you know, we need more welders. We don't need more social media managers. And what, I guess it's it, the the horrible cycle too and it, it's probably i guess there's two sides to it but it's typically the industries that have margins starched out that need to work on the sexiness so that's a, a a difficult thing for the in at the industry level but we talked about it in a previous episode but at like the individual worker level you can make an excellent living in some of these industries that are not sexy and i think that's probably surprising to a lot of people when you when you say like oh you know I don't want to get my hands dirty because I'm too good for this role. It's like, you probably make more money doing this than you would being a social media manager. Yeah. I always put it this way. Do you want to get your hands dirty or have stress? If you want to make money, pick one. Yeah. Like there's, <laughs> there's no hundred thousand dollar a year job that doesn't require hard work and comes with no stress. It's, you know, it comes with a lot more than that. We all know that. Right. Um, but it's just one of those things that our our expectations of what work is anymore it has changed quite a bit. But I just keep thinking about you know there's a lot of places that could afford to compress their time by ten percent. I mean, there's times I rolled into a Chipotle grill at nine thirty, but it wouldn't have been the end of the world if they closed at nine. Like, how much business do they do from like nine till ten or like nine thirty to ten thirty? I don't know. Maybe it's more substantial than I know. Um, but it's just one of those things that is this just the, the start of it. We're now in a position where we have to do this. I'm more worried about, we're already seeing this 
spill over into we don't have enough truck drivers? What happens when this starts hitting the hospitals and healthcare when they're not able to manufacture the things from pharmaceuticals to the chemicals that go into our water? Like there's other parts of the supply chain that start to concern me that if we're coming up with this short on the workforce. Yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking about our, our investment here in the restaurant industry, James, and it's kind of funny that we're talking about this topic as we're about to invest, uh, getting into restaurants as well. But, um, you know, one of the areas that is appealing to the business that we're looking into is the hours of operation. I think that is a great selling point to employees because no, I don't, I don't think no, no one wants to work those late hours anymore. Uh, if they can have something that they don't have the responsibility of being there and being attentive to an issue or a customer at midnight or a 2 a.m. crowd coming in and getting food and having to deal with that and, and the stress and the pressure behind all that, I think if I think it will go a long way for the food industry to look at the hours of operation and not put as much stress on these, you know, uh, late night hours that people just kind of dread doing. Do you imagine working a Taco Bell drive through at 2 a.m.? I, I, I feel sorry for what I used to do <laughs> at 2 a.m. At 2 a.m. was early. I mean, imagine like 3, 4 a.m. You put a whole order in, and by the time you get to the window, you like totally forget it, and you're yelling at them because you thought it was something else. <laughs> or they're like, why is one person ordering $60 worth of Taco Bell? <laughs> Did you say put nacho cheese on everything? <laughs> uh, but, you know, even on the hours, there's a there's a Starbucks by me that it's just been closed for weeks because they have no staff. And there's another one that they changed their hours to open open at 2 p.m. They're open from like two to seven or something. And I'm thinking, you're a you're a coffee breakfast based business. I know you can sell coffee and they got food all day, but how does Starbucks miss out in the morning? Because <laughs> the people don't want to get up in the morning. So not only does people they don't want to do the late night gigs, but no one wants to get up in the morning and go to work anymore. So now you got Starbucks open in the afternoon. So it's going to get to the point to where we don't want to work at all anymore. <sighs> Scary thought, man. It is. I mean, think about the trickle down effect of that. So Starbucks has to close, you know, not just one location, but I'm assuming hundreds of locations and limiting their hours of operation and what that does to revenue. They don't have, you know, they have prime time real estate that their stores are in. So they, they still got to pay rent. Or if they, you know, hopefully they own most of the buildings, but they still have to pay their monthly, you know, rent. And they're only able to do X amount of sales because of the reduced hours. Eventually, they're going to have to start looking at, you know, does it make sense to have our store location here anymore? We're going to break our lease or just go out of business or whatever the case may be. Then you have the, you know, the dozen of employees that are willing to work, no longer have a job because now Starbucks has to close down. You know, that's obviously a, an extreme example, but it will happen to the to the smaller uh, businesses that are out there. Well, that happens. And then, you know, two tenants in a building do that. And the next thing you know, that building's going, you know, on the auction block. There's a, you know, we saw that in 2008, that trickle down effect. It crushed. It, it, who, who survived? Everyone got hit, right? And, you know, your Starbucks paying... 50 bucks a foot for a location that you can only have open five hours a day. It's, uh, yeah, we got problems, but I think you're right. I think the businesses that, you know, are able to sustain during this period, and I don't know how long it's going to last for, but if you can duke it out for, you know, at least another 12 months of, of doing decent, I, I think a lot of other businesses will go out of business and, you know, it's going to have a, a big effect in the future for, for sales growth. I mean, there's always opportunity during times of chaos. It's uh, 
just really tough to mitigate. So, anyways, anything else you got, Kane? No, no, you guys made very strong points there. All right, well, I'm gonna just grub hub my McDonald's today. That way, I don't gotta wait in line. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll spend like twelve dollars on the lunch, and then like another twenty five to get it delivered. <laughs> so, yeah. And then you're gonna blame uh, McDonald's for being too expensive. Yeah, and then like, oh, my fries are cold. <laughs> uh, you just can't win today. All right, I'll catch you guys on the next one.